You don't often hear about arguments between theoretical physicists and archaeologists, but that's exactly what happened when it was discovered that ancient Roman lead has a property that modern lead can't replicate. A property which makes it invaluable for some cutting edge research applications, including building a device to try and identify and detect dark matter. But as the only way to source large amounts of Roman lead is to scavenge ancient shipwrecks and melt down some ancient Roman lead artifacts, that's understandably going to upset some archaeologists. But let's back up a minute, because this whole thing sounds like a bad sci-fi plot. So this ancient Roman lead and its mystical property that I've been alluding to isn't the result of some ancient Roman science that we haven't been able to recreate or unlock yet. It's just that their lead has an additional ingredient which our modern lead doesn't have yet. Time. You see, all lead mined on Earth contains trace amounts of uranium because although uranium is quite rare, it's present all throughout the Earth's crust in a concentration of about 2.8 parts per million, which actually makes it more abundant than gold. But uranium itself isn't actually the issue, because uranium and other metal impurities can easily be separated out from lead during the purification process. But for all the millennia that the lead was in the ground, mixed in with the uranium and everything else, the uranium was actually undergoing a series of decay reactions, eventually forming lead 210, which is a radioactive isotope of lead. So at whatever time the lead is finally mined and separated from all the other impurities, there will be a certain amount of radioactive lead 210, which is effectively impossible to separate from the rest of the lead on a large scale. Because for all intents and purposes, that radioactive lead 210 is identical to any of the other atoms of lead present. It has effectively the same melting point, same reactivity, so it's very hard to separate isotopes like this. So this of course means that all of the modern lead that we're producing is slightly radioactive, nowhere near a level that would be a health risk or even an issue for most applications. But the level will be detectable above background radiation, which could be an issue for some very sensitive experiments. For example, dark matter. So for a bit of background, what is dark matter? No idea. But we know there's something, a lot of something, all over the universe which has mass, or acts like it has mass. So it's something that's acting like matter, but it's much harder to detect, therefore dark matter. So one theory is that dark matter is a new type of particle that they're calling weakly interacting massive particles, or WIMPs. And as the name suggests, these particles would have a lot of mass, but interact very weakly with regular matter, making them very hard to detect. Since 1998, Scientists have been conducting a series of experiments called the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search, or CDMS, with the goal of detecting these WIMP particles by measuring the energy deposited by particles colliding with a silicon and germanium plate. Obviously, when you're talking about measuring the energy from individual particle impacts, you want to remove as much background radiation from the area as possible. Normally, when experiments require a large amount of radiation shielding, they'll use thick sheets of lead, but as we discussed, modern lead has a higher than background level of radiation anyway, so using it to shield the device wouldn't really help at all. But the thing is, as soon as you remove the lead from the ground and start purifying it, you've removed all the uranium which would start decaying into this lead 210. So you've removed the feedstock and the only thing left is the lead 210 that was present when you mined it, and lead 210 has a half-life of only 22 years. So you can imagine after several hundred years, there's effectively zero radiation left in the lead. But physicists are impatient and they don't want to wait 200 years to start their experiment. So assuming you don't have a time machine to send your lead back a couple hundred years, you have to settle for the next best thing. Just find some ancient Roman lead, which they very kindly purified for us 2000 years ago. Here I have a Roman lead slingshot from around 50 AD which was found by a metal detectorist here in England. But you'd need a lot of these to get enough lead to build the shielding for the dark matter detector. And also it'd be quite a shame to melt down some actual Roman artifacts like this, even though these slingshots are quite common. And as it turns out, there was a better solution than just finding random bits of lead in the ground from archeological sites and using that. Divers found a Roman shipwreck on the ocean floor, which 
happened to be carrying the cargo of several tons of lead ingots, among other things, when it sank. These ships were transporting lead to the far reaches of the empire, but sank before they could reach their final destination. And the lead's just been sitting at the bottom of the ocean for 2,000 years, waiting for a purpose. And it's a purpose that the original creators of these ingots couldn't possibly have imagined. Being used in a massive scientific experiment to probe the very nature of our universe. And since these experiments and ones like them are ongoing, there's been several examples of cargo from ancient shipwrecks being taken and used as this low background lead. In fact, it's become quite profitable for salvagers to find these ancient shipwrecks and auction off any lead that they find. Lead ingots recovered from the wreck of a 300 year old Spanish galleon went for $33 per kilogram compared to the price of regular lead, which is about $2 per kilogram. But these ancient lead ingots, although much less interesting than many other Roman artifacts, are still archaeologically interesting. Some of them bear marks and seals of the place they were made, and chemical analysis of them could tell us a lot about the techniques that the Romans used and how well they were able to purify the lead. So, as you can imagine, some archaeologists aren't particularly happy with the idea of these Roman shipwrecks being plundered and the cargo being removed by private companies, melted down and sold off. You might even be wondering how any of this was legal. The 2001 Convention on the Protection of Underwater Cultural Heritage protects these sites from commercial exploitation, but selling or donating some of the cargo for scientific use doesn't seem to be covered under that protection, as there's currently no commercial process which can create lead with as low background radiation as this ancient lead. It's seen by many as a necessary sacrifice to allow these important experiments to take place. And on top of that, it doesn't seem like they ever use the entire cargo hall to melt down as low background lead to sell off. They always keep a good amount of the ingots in a museum so they can be studied. After all, is it really going to make that much difference if the museum keeps a thousand ingots or all 4,000 from a hall? I couldn't find any specific numbers for the amount of lead that was used in these dark matter experiments, but in 2010, the Cryogenic Underground Observatory for Rare Events used 270 ingots from a haul of a thousand from a 200 year old Roman shipwreck that was salvaged off the coast of Sardinia. They used the lead in their experiment to shield a neutrino detector. Their aim was to detect a rare event called a double beta decay, which could prove that neutrinos are their own antiparticle. If that were proven, it could help explain why our universe seems to favour matter over antimatter. The rest of the ingots in that hall were left intact for a museum to study, but despite this, some archaeologists still feel it's quite short-sighted to be salvaging these ancient Roman shipwrecks, where if they were left intact in a hundred years or so, we could have much better technology to be able to do better, less destructive archaeology. In the same way that a lot of the early Egyptologists weren't the best at preserving the mummies and artifacts that they found, and in fact ended up grinding up a lot of these mummies for medicine and paint long before a lot of our current scientific instruments and analysis techniques were around. My take on the whole thing, as someone who's neither a physicist or an archaeologist, but interested in scientific advancement and historical artifacts, is that the way it's been handled seems pretty reasonable to me. I do think trading the ingots for this valuable material that could advance these scientific experiments is worth it. When I first read about this, I got the impression from some of the articles that the ancient Roman lead being used was much more unique artifacts, like tools, weapons, ammunition, and they were being melted down into ingots, which I think would be a lot more controversial and upsetting for people. But once you realise it's actually just these ready-made ingots that have limited archaeological value in themselves, I think most people would fall on the same side of the fence and say it's probably a worthy sacrifice. But I'm interested to know what you think, so let me know in the comments whether you think it's a good idea to use these ingots for these experiments. Thanks for watching, bye!